Hey guys, coming back for Legend tomorrow, Season 1, Episode 2, Pilot Part 2, and I was definitely really looking forward to this episode. I'm one of the few that really like last week's premiere, and I know there were a lot of people that didn't, and I can understand why, because, you know, there was a lot of exposition, a lot to get through, but this episode really, I think, was the official start for the show, and I think if the CW would have, they would have made this a two-hour premiere. The problem is the 100 is on directly right after it, so they can't do, obviously, a two-hour premiere, and I thought this worked really well, though, because it really did feel like the second half of last week's premiere, so I like this episode. It was called Pilot Part 2, and without a doubt, this definitely was a much better episode than last week's, and I loved last week's premiere. I just thought this episode worked better as an episode. Last week's episode works as setting everything up, while this episode really shows what the show is going to be, and I really love this episode, but let's just get into it. So much happened, and already there's a lot happening in the show, and I'm loving that. So we start off as the Wave Rider descends in Norway 1975, and Rip says that Boardman had theorized that this is where Savage was, and we get to see a lot more of Vandal Savage tonight, which is something I like. Now, I want to talk about something with Vandal Savage. I've heard many people say that Vandal Savage is not that big of a threat, or he doesn't come across as that threatening, um, and me personally, here's something I like about Vandal Savage. Just his character in general gives enough of a reason for him to be threatening. And I know there are people that are saying, oh, he has no inflection in his voice and he's not charismatic. Vandal Savage is supposed to be immortal. He's not really supposed to have emotions. And I think that's one of the reasons why he's so intimidating. This is really the sort of villain that they've never dealt with before. And that's something I definitely really liked here. So... The Hawk suggests that they could go back and save Boardman, but Rip says that they can't change things that they were involved in or there would be catastrophic effects, not the time stream, and it's clear that Rip is a very stern leader. Like, he really seems like he knows what he's doing, and he's very, um, you know, when it comes to time, he definitely knows what he's doing. So Rip says they're heading for a weapon sale that Savage is participating in, and there's a bit of a power struggle here because... Both Ray, Cole, Captain Cold, and uh, Rip all want to be in charge, you know. And I thought they all had valid reasons as to why, you know. Captain, you know, Cold thinks it's because he's involved with crime and that he should lead, while Ray thinks that he'd just be a very good leader in that sense. And Rip, in the meantime, thinks that you know, hey, I'm the one that recruited all of you. I should be the leader. And I thought that made the most sense. I thought Rip was going to be the leader here. But it kind of seems like Rip is getting a bit sidelined, actually. In fact, he doesn't really have anything to do with this mission, which I found very interesting. So when they get there, it is Stein, though, that surprised everyone. He yells at the guard, and he's the one that gets them in. So you can tell that Stein is going to be a good, would be a good leader for them, for this mission at least. And I feel like it's going to be one of those things where they have a different leader every week, and that could be definitely very interesting because that's something that definitely is going to happen. There's definitely going to be a power struggle there. And, again, something, again, I like is the interactions. These are characters having interactions, and I like that there is tension between Cold and, um, you know, um, and Ray. That's definitely something that's going to continue. So, once inside, there's a group of terrorists and criminals all there to bid on a warhead, including Damien Dark, which, it was really cool to see Damien Dark, um, in 1975, and there's a pair of ghosts there, and... He was, which I thought was kind of funny that he was debating with Savage, and Savage isn't a buyer, though. He's actually the seller, and they successfully win the auction, but when Savage gets suspicious of them, he offers a discount to whoever brings him the group's heads, because Savage doesn't know where they came from, why they want to bid this warhead, and we know that he was after this warhead, and because of the way last week's episode ended, and a fight then breaks out, really this huge fight, which this scene was awesome, honestly. This is the the kind of stuff that I love in this show. A fight breaks out, the Hawks along with Jax join in, finally Ray pops out of Stein's pocket at miniature size and joins the fray as well, which Ray was like Ant-Man here, this was awesome. Savage watches it all with great interest until the Hawks come out and they want to take him in, but he sets the bomb off to go cover off, to go off to cover his exit, and Ray then shrinks down to try and deactivate it, but he just ends up speeding up the countdown with only 30 seconds left, um, basically... Uh, the Firestorm takes the bomb as far away as possible while the others continue to fight. And when part of Ray's tech being damaged in the fight, when the bomb goes off, Firestorm successfully takes all the energy in and they are just like this close for that bomb to go off. I mean, really, they were this close and 
already this was an awesome episode. I mean, that whole fight, we did not have that last week. We had an intense fight scene, but not anything like that. And if this is the kind of action we're going to get on the show, I'm going to be very excited because this is awesome. I love this. And seeing the team already working together, despite the fact that some of them don't even like each other, I definitely like seeing. They're realizing that they have to fight. And Back at the Wave Rider, Rip is obviously really mad at the team, which I honestly thought he had a right to be upset, and I can understand if there are people saying, oh, he is kind of just trying to be the leader when he's not, but you know what? It really does make sense as to why Rip should be upset. I mean, he warned them of the effects of time, and basically we find out that one of Savage's cronies found a piece of Ray's technology, and he's mostly upset at the team, though, because, of course, of the fact that they already faced Savage, so Savage already knows that they're out there, and they weren't really secret at all, which is definitely the opposite of what Rip would have wanted them to do, and obviously, I know there are people that could be like, well, why didn't we just make Rip the leader? Rip was outnumbered by Cold. That's who they thought would be best for them. They thought Cold would be best, so Rip was sadly outnumbered, and I definitely think it's interesting that there's this power struggle between Rip and all these other characters. That's definitely something I'm very interested in of what's going to happen there. So now the present danger because Savage will be able to develop a weapon way too powerful to be countered in 1975. And obviously, that's a big thing to worry about because now, and he shows them basically Central City and tells them that Central City is good now, but knowing Savage, he could get to Central City very fast and completely ruin it. I mean, we know that Savage is basically worse than Hitler. I mean, really, he is. I mean, if you think about it, what he's doing, killing children like that, he's basically a dictator and he needs to be stopped, so there's no telling what could happen now. So Rip says the time isn't solid yet, but they have very little time to save their present um, from the mistake that they've made in the past, and this is something that Stein should be an expert in, because Stein knows all about time. You know, he dealt with it with Barry and everything, he knows what time can do, um, so I will say it was a bit out of character for Stein to not really know what he's doing, but I feel like Stein did know what he was doing. He was very experienced. He just really hasn't dealt with time in this way before. He hasn't traveled through time. You know, he knows the effects of time, but he hasn't really traveled, and that's definitely something I like seeing here. We haven't seen a ton of time travel on Arrow or The Flash, so that's something we're really getting to explore in Legends tomorrow, and I really do like. I've seen people compare this to Doctor Who, and I definitely would agree with that. It's it's like Doctor Who in the sense that they're going somewhere new every episode, and I definitely really like that. So in Rip's office, we see the Hawks are mourning the loss of Boardman because they barely knew him, and it's it's really sad because this is a son that they really wanted to care for, but they barely knew the guy. So there's really, you know, they, they feel kind of stupid that they're mourning over him, but they have a reason to be upset, obviously, because it was their son. So in the pocket of Boardman's jacket, we see that um, basically... Uh, Carter finds a newspaper clipping about an Egyptian blade that Hawkgirl can identify as the one that Savage used to kill them in their first lives, and basically this is how they could possibly beat Savage. They think that this is a way to do it, and I do don't really know if this is going to work, but just the fact that they have a way to do that, I definitely like seeing. And the way that they're definitely using um, the Hawkmans, you know, kind of on their own, I definitely like seeing, because you know what, this is much more of a personal mission for them. This is someone they've wanted to take down for a very long time. For everyone else, they're involved because Rip forced them to. And I feel if Rip would have gotten to Kendra and Carter, obviously Kendra initially didn't want to do this, but Carter did, and like I said, this is a lot more of a personal revenge mission for them, and especially the ending of this episode, this is definitely going to become a revenge mission. We'll get into that. So, in the Wave Rider, the team figures out the only way they can track Ray's suit with the available technology 1975 is to get in touch with the younger Stein. If you guys have seen Back to the Future Part 2, you know what can happen um, with that. But that does not happen here. He basically, he we find that he was developing such a technology right around this time, and um, obviously, Rip is very worried because you know what happens if you come face to face with yourself that things could end up really bad here. But the Hawks come to tell the team about the dagger that it can be used to kill Savage, provided Hawk Girl can summon enough memories of their past lives to read an incantation inscribed on the blade. 
And basically, it's decided that while the rogues and Ray will try to steal the dagger, Stein will go with Jax and Sarah to get a device. And I like that it was a different um, group this time, because, you know, last week, Jax, Captain Cold, and Heatwave, they had to sit out. But here, they didn't have to. And I definitely like seeing that. Definitely some really great stuff here. And we go into Ivy Town, and I loved Jax's little rant on 1975. I thought that was very funny. He's like, is this how they dress and everything? Jax is definitely a very, a very funny character. I will say... I'm still not a huge fan of the actor. I just don't think he's that great of an actor, but the character and the lines they give him is enough of a reason for me to like his character. So the trio almost immediately see his younger self, and Stein introduced himself to his younger self as Professor Elon Musk, which was a very smart thing for Stein to do. Obviously, he can't say that he's his future self because he's going to make the other Stein go crazy. And the trio say they're coming to pick his brain about alpha particles, and we meet Marty, who is is much more who is very full of himself and has a bit of a crush on Sarah right away Sarah's flirting with him and he invites them to smoke some pot and talk about physics and First of all, how can you not get a crush on Sarah? I'll say that right now. Two, I loved seeing this overconfident, kind of dickish version of Marty. And I don't think Stein really is a dick. I mean, sure, he's made some questionable moves, and he definitely has that power struggle, and definitely comes across as a know-it-all, but this Marty is a lot more cocky, and you definitely really do see that. And you can definitely tell that this is a younger Stein, and I really did like seeing that. And again, this is something that I'm I'm loving is that we're getting to see not only their descendants but we're getting to see them as younger um you know as um when they were young and i definitely like seeing that so on the wave rider the hawks try to retrieve some of kendra's memory so she can read the incantation and she gets a flashback seeing the pair of them making love, but when Hawkman makes a move on her, she leaves. And very interesting stuff here. And at first I thought it was a bit out of character because it seemed like last week Kendra was accepting Carter's advances. But I think it was probably because they both just mourned a loss and she just needed some support. And she still can't remember. She still doesn't have these memories of her and Carter, you know, they're just not there, and she wants to have these memories, but they're not there right now, and unfortunately, they're just not there, and I really thought this was a really well handled the way they did this, I definitely really like that. So, at Savage's base, he has already deduced that the legends are from the future. Smart guy, definitely very smart guy. And he gives people 24 hours to reverse engineer um, race tech. So, you can definitely tell that Savage has a plan. He knows what's going on. And I definitely like seeing that. Definitely really crazy stuff there. So at the house where the Egyptian knife is housed, Ray rewrites the security pad outside. It's a dummy box though. Security guards come and the rogues take them down pretty quickly and the rogues obviously know what they're doing and I think the rogues really showed um, how they're going to be of use to the team here because they've had experience with crimes. They know how to, you know, take down and uh, beat policemen, things like that, obviously, because they're just experienced in that kind of thing. So I like that we saw how they're going to work with Ray, and I definitely really like seeing that. Um, so in Marty's lab, he pontificates about his alpha particle tracker, and he goes to get some snacks for the munchies his pot has inspired, and while he's gone, Stein starts going through Marty's lab looking of the particle tracker, because that's obviously the reason they're there, and during the conversation with Jackson and Sarah, he tells them that this is the month that he's set to meet his future wife, so he doesn't want Sarah to keep flirting with Marty, and I love the line where he said that Sarah was sexy, and Sarah's like, you think I'm sexy? And he's like, please don't finish that I thought that was very funny obviously very awkward that Sarah and Marty had this attraction definitely very funny stuff there and again that's a very good way for them to interact these characters I definitely really like seeing that and I know there have been some people that have said they don't like this version of Sarah but I really do like it I mean think about it. she was just resurrected she's still trying to find herself and she's kind of just trying to live in the moment and have fun you can definitely tell she's doing that and I love that and just the fact we're getting more Katie Lutz is enough for reason for me to tune in because she's doing a great job really she is so at the house with the dagger the rogues start looking around for all the other stuff they steal and ray objects and the three of them start to get into a bit of a scuffle and it sets off another alarm a cage drops down around them and i did like the 
conflict that the rogues got into with Rey. I'll talk about a scene that comes up a little bit later, but definitely some stuff gets very interesting here. And in Marty's lab, Stein finds the particle tracker, but he is caught by Marty, who threatens to call the police on them, but Stein once again comes up with a very good plan. He tells him that he's being interviewed for a profile in an upcoming Wells journal, and he plays to his younger self's ego because, you know, he was very cocky and very full of himself, and he asked to borrow the tracker so they can photograph it, and Marty rejects them, and Sarah knocks him out with a bomb, which I thought was hilarious, just the fact that she just knocked him out. I mean, it made sense, obviously, for her to knock him out, because he can't know what they're doing, so they get, and they have to go on with the mission, obviously, so they get ready to take the tracker, but Stein steals, sets an alarm clock next to his unconscious younger self, so he doesn't miss a party tonight, and with it, the opportunity to meet his wife, and this was the Stein that I really liked. I know there were some people that thought Stein was a bit out of character last week with drugging Jacks and shit, um, but this really did make sense. He obviously wants his younger self, to, you know, he wants things to turn out well for his younger self, so that doesn't change because for all he knows, he could end up to, you know, he could end up without a wife, and he obviously wants Marty to end up with Clarissa. That's just something he wants because obviously he wants to be with his wife, and I like the way that Stein set this up. I definitely really like that. So at the Dagger House, um, we see that Heat Wave goes to trigger a system default, and we get this very good scene between Cold and Ray. Cold's kind of telling Ray how insignificant he is and how he doesn't really matter and how, to him, he isn't even much of a leader. And again, it really goes with Ray trying to be a leader. It's clear that Ray is just trying to be that hero, but it doesn't really seem like anyone wants him to be. In fact, it doesn't really seem like anyone really sees Ray as a hero. They kind of just see him as another um, guy, and I definitely really do like seeing that, I mean, you think of Ray, he really is just the DC's version of Ant-Man right now, that really is what he is, and he needs to prove that he's more, and, I mean, I think he's shown that he's more, but clearly the rest of the team doesn't really see that, and I definitely like this conflict that Cold and Ray are going through, there's definitely gonna be a bit of a power struggle there, and I really like seeing that, but I, but what I also like is that they realize that they have to get on with the mission, they can't let these, you know, their creative differences get in the way of completing the mission. You really did see that here. So on board the Wave Rider, Kendra comes to apologize to Carter for running off, but he actually admits that he's pressuring her unfairly. And I would agree with Carter in the sense that she doesn't really know what he's doing, but of course, they're destined to be together. You know, Chiara and Khufu, and Prince Khufu, that's the prophecy. They're meant to be together, and she starts trying to meditate again so she can remember her previous lives, and when she does, she sees Khufu present the dagger to her, uh, present, the, not present, present the dagger, the dagger to her, and on it is an inscription, and it's a poem about rebirth, and the pair start to kiss, and Kendra wakes up and remembers that the poem promised that they would be, um, together forever and now she's remembering the prophecy she's remembering what they had to go through and i definitely really like seeing that but that's what makes it all the more tragic we'll get into that so at savage's lab stein jackson sarah have found ray's tech and sarah jumps down beats up most of the men in the room and sarah is just a badass i mean in two episodes she's beat most of the men up and i love stein's line stein honestly might have had the funniest line when he said oh that's why i found her attractive i thought that was just great i love that and definitely really great stuff there he basically we they take the tech back and by the way something else i really like is that they're really exploring stein's comedy which is something i don't really think we saw in the flash and the flash he was a lot more serious here he definitely is a bit of a jokester and i really like that so at the house savage drags heat wave at gunpoint to the cage and on the wave rider, Stein looks down at his hand to see that his wedding ring has vanished, and he's starting to worry, and that's very much like Back to the Future with the picture, which I definitely like that kind of reference that they did there, and he's starting to worry about damage to the timeline when Marty shows up and demands answers, because he obviously has no idea what's going on, you know, he doesn't know why he's there, why they're there, why they knocked him out, he doesn't really understand, so at his home, Savage has figured out the team is from the future, he monologues for a while, asking them to call the team, he wants wants to see the Hawks, and very intense scene, honestly, very intense scene, I think he really showed his ambition, and him wanting to go after them, I mean, the way that he was telling them that they're nothing, and that they think that they're so powerful, but they can't beat him, and that he's immortal, and that no matter what, he will find them, and how he just put it together, I definitely,
definitely really loved seeing that. And he, you know, the actor that played Vandal Savage, I think, really sold it in this scene. He really is doing a great job. So he obviously wants to get to the Hawks. That's his main thing here. And on the way, right, we see that Stein is very angry that they screw up his past. You know, he feels that they've completely screwed up the past. And... I love the scene between Jax and Stein because it wasn't just bickering. This was Jax generally telling Stein that he needs to stop being so hard on himself, that even though they screwed things up, things can get better, and I definitely like seeing that. But Stein is obviously very concerned because he thinks that this could really mess with his with his life, and yeah, it really could. I mean, what they did is a very is very detrimental to Stein's you know, present life. I mean, for all he knows, like I said, he could come home and find that his wife is gone because he doesn't know her. So obviously he's very worried about what's going to happen, but I like that Jax is motivating him. I like that this isn't just two guys bickering. I like that they seem to have a genuine friendship, and I definitely really like seeing that. Is it different than what Stein had to go through um, with... Um, with what's his name, with Rob, I can't remember his name, you know, Kate, Caitlin's, uh, dead, deceased, uh, husband, you know who I'm talking about, um, you know, Ronnie, 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 this is obviously is different than what Stein to go through with Ronnie, but I like that, I like that they've changed it up a bit, it's taken Jackson Stein, I think, a while to form a bond, but it definitely seems like they form one, and I really like seeing that. So, and that's really one of the things this episode had very well. It had the heart there that I really wanted. Last week's episode, I feel like, had it, but this episode had a lot more of that. I definitely like that. So, the pair to the bridge to shoo Marty away. They get the call from um, Cold and Heatwave and head to, Sav to Savage's mansion to face him. And outside, we see that Cold gives the Hawks their dagger. They head inside while the rest of the team takes on his security team outside. And Carter stabs Savage, but forgets the, pro the poem and is stabbed for his trouble, and Savage tells him that since the blade belonged to Shyara, it must be her who wields it to kill him. He steps aside while she tends to Carter, and Carter's dead. He dies right there, and his soul seemingly enters Savage. Now, I'm not going to say this is the end of Carter, because this is a show, and this is a universe where there's a thing called a Lazarus Pit, and the fact that Sarah is a character that was resurrected, I mean, there's a character on the show that was resurrected, I think the same thing could definitely happen with Carter, so I'm not going to say that Carter's necessarily dead, but wow, this was a very ballsy move, and I really give it to the show for doing that. I mean, the fact that they just killed off Carter like that, first of all, I think they did that for two reasons. One, a lot of people are saying that Carter's character is very insignificant and in that he's really not working. I've heard many people say that they're not a fan of Carter and that they like Kendra but not Carter, so this is a way to see Kendra move forward without Carter. Two, I feel like we really got... We we really understand Carter as a character and how this is really going to affect the team. And I definitely really like seeing that and also the motivation and everything. Just really powerful stuff there. I'm very... I'm surprised that they did it, but I really am impressed that they did it at the same time, and I really do give it to the show for actually going through with killing off Carter. So, Savage stabs her as well, but before she dies, obviously she's not going to die. The, and I thought that they were going to kill Kendra. I'm like, they are not killing Kendra. There's no way they're doing that. Um, the actress is too good. The character's too good. There's no way they're going to do that. So, the Adam blasts him out of the room. The team brings Kendra onto the Wave Rider, where they send her to the medical bay, and... Gideon's tending to her wounds, but Kendra regains consciousness, and she, you, this really great scene where she's so upset that she didn't get to tell Carter that she remembered their love, and she just feels really bad because now she has all those memories, and she didn't even get to tell him, and it's just really tragic that this had to happen, and I'm gonna say now, I don't think this is the first member of the team to go. I think there are gonna be more members that die. I could honestly see that, so we'll have to see. So on the bridge, Rip tells the team that they're stuck in 1975 for a while. A time jump right now might aggravate who are currently what are currently stable injuries, and he doesn't want to hurt them. So Rip then brings Stein to university, and I really like this scene with Rip. I think it really showed that Rip can be trusted. That Rip is a guy, isn't just some guy that wants to help them. That he, you know, he actually does want to help them, and I really like seeing that. So Rip brings Stein to university, where he reveals that he encouraged Mari to attend the mixer and he basically got marty and clarissa together he's the one to do it and not far away marty is kissing clarissa for the first time and stein's wedding ring returns and 
I definitely really like seeing that. Really great stuff there. And uh, I just like seeing that Rip really does care about this team. And maybe they didn't think that he did, but I think this really just proved his loyalty. That, yeah, I can be trusted, and I know what I'm doing, and I am going to help you guys out. I definitely really like seeing that. So then the ending of the episode, back on the Wave Rider, Rip asked the team if they're still with him. They all agreed they're in, especially after Carter's death, and basically... Um, Ray asks what their next mission is going to be, and that's how the episode ends. And overall, guys, I really love this. If you really look at these two episodes as one episode, it's a very solid premiere, definitely. And I'm definitely interested in seeing where the show is going to go. I think they really showed where we're going to go in this show, and I'm definitely very interested. But let's talk about Vandal Savage. I mean, obviously, Savage knows where the team is. It seems like he's going to follow their every move. And I will say that if every episode is going to be they have some encounter with Savage and then they just miss him, it is going to become a bit tedious, but it makes sense, obviously, because Savage is immortal, so there's no telling what could happen here, and I definitely really like that. And something I really do love about the show is just that they go everywhere, so really the possibilities are endless as to who they can encounter, what we're going to see, and I definitely really like seeing that. Let's talk about Kendra. This is definitely a lot more personal of a mission for Kendra. She's now avenging. Carter's death and she's definitely gonna go after Savage and who knows what she's gonna do I mean there are definitely a lot of possibilities of what's gonna happen there I'm definitely interested in seeing um what Kendra's gonna do because now she's even she has even more of a motivation to go after Savage you know maybe she did before but now there's even more of one it just makes sense now um that you know she's gonna go after Savage um who is going to be the real leader of the team? Like I said, I really do feel like there's going to be a lot of clashing, especially with Ray and Cold. And do you think that Ray is going to become significant? It's clear that he wants to become significant, but I don't really think the team sees him as a leader right now. He's kind of just the guy that wants to be a leader, but he's not. He keeps getting sidelined and... Definitely, I really do like seeing that. Captain Cold and um, Heat Wave, they haven't gone on a single mission yet. You know, they've done things here and there, obviously, like help them, you know, help Ray with the, the crime and everything. But I'm definitely interested in seeing if, if uh, you know, Rip's actually going to let them go. We'll have to see what happens there because that definitely is going to be very interesting. And I'm just very interested in, again, seeing what we're going to see, you know, who's out there, what we're going to see, things like that. It just really interests me, and the possibilities, like I said, are definitely endless. Um, Is Carter really dead? Are they going to find a way to resurrect him? I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if Sarah says, hey, you know, I was resurrected in the Lazarus pit. Maybe we should put Carter in there. Granted, it would be a bit far-fetched, but it makes sense. I mean, this is a world where you can really bring back anyone and you're never actually dead. And that's something I definitely really like seeing. I mean, we just had the reverse Flash return on Flash. Yeah, that kind of was pointless, but, you know, at the same time, it's possible. And again, it really shows that the possibilities are endless, and I really like seeing that. So overall, guys, I'm really enjoying the show. I think it's very different than Flash and Arrow because it's really exploring time, and this team we don't really have a team like this on Flash and Arrow. Yeah, we have characters, but Flash and Arrow, the Flash is the, you know, the main member of that team and Oliver's the main member of obviously Team Arrow and those teams would not be together had it been for Flash or Arrow. Here, you have a bunch of unknowns right now. You have a bunch of unknowns that are kind of insignificant, and as Rip Hunter says, they have potential to become legends. So definitely that makes me very interested in seeing if their characters are going to succeed, and definitely I'm interested in seeing if we're going to see any more die. I mean, now that Carter's dead, it really shows that I think no one is safe. No one is safe, anything can happen, and I really love that. Overall, guys, let me know what you guys saw this episode. What did you like the first part more or the second part? I think it really works as one giant episode, really, if you think about it. I mean, the ending of last week's episode is, is not an ending to an episode. It's an ending to a first part, not an ending to an episode. Overall, guys, let me know what you guys think of this show so far. I'm really loving it. I will see you guys in the next video, which, guys... I am behind on Colony currently, and I do want to catch up on it, so my next review will be probably for Episodes 2, and then I'm going to review Episode 3 um, of Colony, and I will see you guys for that. Okay, bye.